So good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for this workshop Wednesday fireside chat. I'm Aaron Malkin. I'm the literary director and dramaturg at New York Theater Workshop. And we are so grateful that you are joining us. Um, we're broadcasting this live from Zoom and simultaneously on Facebook Live. And uh, we are appreciative of having you. There's over 150 people watching uh, via Zoom and more via Facebook. Uh, folks are tuning in from all over the world. So thank you so much for being in community with us. Um, this fireside chat and all of the workshops uh, virtual programming is offered free to the entire New York Theater Workshop community, wherever you may be. Um, if you're in a position to support the work that we are doing to keep uh, to keep us uh, going. We appreciate you doing so. There's a link to donate in the chat if you're on Zoom and they'll be in the comments on Facebook Live. Um, we are very excited today to have our Director of Education, Alexander Santiago Herrao, uh, with Julian Boal. And the conversation will last around an hour. Um, Alex will moderate a conversation with Julian for the first chunk of time and then I will pop back in to help moderate um, the Q&A. If you have a Q&A about anything technical or logistical, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A feature if you're on Zoom, write it in the comments if you're on Facebook, and we will do the best to address it. And if you have questions for Alex or Julian, feel free to write them in, and we'll get to as many as we can in the time allotted. And if you're commenting on Facebook, we will transfer them over to Zoom uh, so you can be a part of the conversation as well. If you see a question you agree with, feel free to upvote it. Uh, or like it on Facebook, so we can uh, really touch on the most pressing, uh, the most pressing questions. Um, I think that is all I have. I will now turn it over to Alex and Julian. Thank you so much both for being with us. Thank you, Aaron. I'm just uh, waiting for Julian to to come on on. Hey, can you Sorry. hear me well? Can you hear me well? Perfectly well. Fantastic. Um, so welcome everyone. Welcome Julian. Um, I'm so excited to be here with you in conversation at this time um, when uh, sort of the world uh, uh, came to a halt in a way, um, you know, because of the coronavirus um, and those of, of us in the theater world um, begin to grapple with um, the reality of the moment and what it would mean to our work into the communities that we serve. I immediately wanted to talk to you about your work uh, because um, so much of the conversation that we have had, um, particularly in the US, um, has been around theater as a commodity, theater as part of a labor market. Um, and, and we haven't had really a substantial conversation about the role of theater um, in political movements, um, in community organizing, uh, really popular theater and, and, and the effect of theater to aid communities, oppressed communities, marginalized communities. And I wanted to talk with you about it um, because of your work. But first, how are, how are you doing? How, how, is, uh, how, how is the situation in Brazil at the moment? The situation in Brazil is terrific. It's horrible. It's a uh, horror on earth. Uh, we have, as a president, Bolsonaro, which, which is a maniac, which is a genocide of maniac, that is forcing up a, a policy of opening up, opening up the, the country to, to trade, well, opening the shops, opening, the, opening up the economy, which and it did it since the beginning, and uh, you know, calling the COVID a little flu on national television, that it was just a little flu, and that himself, if he got the COVID, as he was a former athlete, he would not feel nothing, just the effects of a little flu. Uh, so uh, he wants to open, you know, open up the shops, he wants to open up the economy. He's uh, in a constant battle with the governors and mayors that are trying not to, to go back to life as normal because life ain't as normal. When uh, Brazil reached the 10,000 people dead, which was uh, one week ago, as far as I remember, 
he was uh, jet skiing, using a jet ski in a lake of Brasilia. So a complete denial of the importance, a complete, uh, uh, how you say that in English, sorry, uh, not giving any importance to life. His son, uh, one of his son, that is also in politics, said bad things about the Chinese government. The, minister, the secretary of education also said bad things about the, the, minister, the Chinese government. Therefore, the Chinese government is not making any trade with Brazil regarding all the health, uh, you know, ventilators, uh, masks or stuff like that that we need. And uh, uh, this uh, political scenario of denial is creating a huge tension that might lead, uh, it's not something that would, it's completely out of the table, to a new kind of coup d'etat that we would face in one week, two weeks, maybe a month or so. It's, uh, the dice are rolling and it's very uh, difficult for us to be, uh, as my father would put it, the audience of those dice being rolled mm -hmm. and not having the, the place that was our place uh, in order to fight, in order to struggle, which is the street. We, don't, we cannot gather. So we need to find other ways of doing it. Uh, till now, it's, it's been a, a difficult process to, to find it. Yeah, I, I, I was going to say that um, we seem to be in, in a similar situation here. We, you have a precedent that fashions himself after our precedent. <laughs> and mm. while B Bolsonaro was in a lake, ours was golfing as uh, um, the country here, the US hit 100,000 people that have uh, died from, from COVID. Mm. Um, so the similarities, of course, are, are, um, are, are striking um, mm. between, the, the two, the, between the two countries and the policies and the approach to the policy. Um, you have um, been doing, and you talk about sort of the, you know, the streets, of course, taken away from us as a, as this, as, as a place where, you know, where, you know, we can go to, to protest and to do the work. Could you, could you talk a little bit about the work that you're doing now in Brazil? You have worked with popular theater movements all around the world. Um, uh, and, and, I believe three years ago, uh, uh, co-founded or, or a founding member of the Popular Theater School. Could you talk a little bit about what the Popular Theater School is? How did it start? Um, what is mm -hmm. the goal of it? So it started four years ago. Well, now would be the fourth year of, uh, of the school. And it started because I was invited by the Landless Movement of Brazil to be the kind of curator, let's say like this, of uh, a theater festival that they were organizing. It was a larger, it was an arts festival and I was the curator just of the Theater of the Press festival. And I was able to invite people from all over. I was able to invite uh, Jana Sanskriti, the, this Indian movement of Theater of the Press that uh, we will talk about at some point. People from Portugal, people from Israel, a mutual friend of us, Rena Lom. Uh, and I was able also to invite people that were much closer, people from Argentina, that belonged to a movement that I thought that was extremely interesting, that was called La Dignidad. And within La Dignidad, they had a, a, a popular theater school. So uh, we had, uh, João Brito and myself, we had the idea of opening such a school in uh, Rio de Janeiro. The fact, the problem was that we didn't have a movement such as La Dignidad to host us. So we decided to not be a school of a movement open to everyone, but a school for the movements open only to activists from different movements. And that's how the, the, the popular theater started, as a school in which people would join, people from movements, activists from different movements. And I think that we had at the beginning something like I don't know, eight to 10 movements, something like this, uh, different movements of free. Uh, so the, the idea is that they would get trained and then they would go back to uh, their movements uh, and they would use the techniques that they had learned with us. It's been months that I'm not speaking English, so I hope that uh, my English is not no too worse right now. No worries, you're doing great. Okay. So that was the idea, uh, came mostly youth movements, organization of the youth and uh, occupiers movements. By occupiers, 
is not like uh, Wall Street, uh, Occupy Wall Street movements. By Occupy, I mean people that occupy land or occupy buildings. Peasants that occupy land or people without house that occupies buildings in order to have a place where to live. Uh, and that was the first year that we teach Brecht, Fiat of the Press mainly. And then the second year, uh, the con political conjuncture of Brazil and specifically of Rio changed completely with the assassination of Marielle Franco. Marielle Franco was uh, a woman, a black woman, lesbian from the slum, a socialist uh, that was recently elected uh, as a councilwoman uh, of the city of Rio de Janeiro. And the 14th of March, uh, she was executed. And that made a, a, a huge commotion, a huge trauma. Many of us uh, knew Marielle, Marielle was at the, the marriage of Geo, of, of the other co-founder of, of, uh, of the, the school. Uh, many people from the school were activists for the campaign of Marielle, so there was this closeness, but it was something for all of three, a, a very huge moment. And we decided no longer to be just a school for activists, but we decided to become also an activist school. By an activist school, I mean a school uh, that would open the doors, but not only open the doors to let people in, but also go to the streets with people. So on the 14th of April is that when we started, we invited everyone that wanted to join in. And there was, I don't know, at the end of the, there was something like 40 people. We did a workshop, we created several scenes and we went into the street and joined the march that was done for the uh, uh, one month of the execution of Marielle. I hope that you are not hearing the dog as well as I am. Uh, okay. It's okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. I'm still good. Okay, so we, uh, we did this. We were in the middle of the march, but also we started to be a little bit in front of the march, in front of bars, in front of squares, anywhere that there were people to perform certain scenes and then the march would join and then we would go to another place to perform for other people, to try to connect with people around in another way that the march would, uh, would connect. That worked very well. We, we got a sense of, uh, of fulfillment, of uh, the, also of no longer be afraid, because we were extremely afraid at that moment. And then we started to do it a lot of times. Uh, also performance, performance inside of occupations, of uh, occupied buildings, of occupied land, uh, performance in political meetings, and so on and so on. And that was the, this year. Because also we were seeing that Bolsonaro was rising and gaining momentum. So it was a part of actions in order to try to fight against Bolsonaro. A fight that, as you know, we lost. We are um, hundreds of thousands of Brazilians. And then we decided to create a third moment uh, for the school. Not only a school for, for activists, not only an activist school, but a, a school that would promote the creation of others theater schools, other activist theater schools. And we went into several places that are, uh, are spaces that are owned by the social movement. By space, I mean, uh, not the physical space, but are the institutions. Community spaces, yeah. Yeah, community spaces in which, uh, in order to pass the, the university here in Brazil, you need to, to stay one year uh, preparing a test or six months preparing a test that you are going to do the test and then you can enter the university if your score was high enough for entering it. Certain social movements do a kind of pre-test schools for the people that are inside, uh, uh, you know, slums uh, that don't have a very qualified education, they can get more education in the space in order to get there. It's a service of direct solidarity to the community, a space in which another kind of sociability can be built, but it's also a space in which you can teach, you know, history in a more critical manner and so on. And then in those spaces, we went and we created a nucleus, a basis of people with those students doing theater of the press. Is it clear what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes? Yeah. What was the idea? The idea is that uh, in those spaces, uh, you know, in those pre-test school, they learn more critically history, but they need to learn the history in order to pass the test. 
when they teach Portuguese, they teach Portuguese in a more critical manner, but they need to teach the Portuguese that is needed to go to the test. Theater became the only space where these youth, most of them are youth not only, but in which those people could speak not of the subject that were imposed because of the death, but they could speak about themselves. And also a space in which people were not regulated uh, in the same calendar than the one of the text. By that I mean that you are you enter in one of those pre-test schools, you study a lot, and then you try to pass the test, you fail or you succeed, but then you leave the pre-test school. The idea of creating those groups is that people would not leave, that people would remain and not be organized within the university, but within the neighborhood from which they were. And we created four of them. It was rather successful in one year to create, and it was a difficult year you know, after the election of Bolsonaro. And this year, right now, uh, we had monitors enough in order to try to create eight of those groups. That was the start of the year, but the idea was we wanted to reach 12 groups like this till the end of the year and then came covid and then yeah. now we turned into uh, online uh, trainings and stuff like this because it's what we have for now yeah um so 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 really what what you have done is sort of uh, really established community schools in sort of the the critical pedagogy popular education um tradition um, that takes into consideration yeah. what's, happen what's happening in the community and how to sustain community within the community. Um, I am curious. I am curious about the aesthetic of the school. What how, how, uh, you have talked uh, about teaching Brecht and theater of the oppressed. What what is the approach of the school from from a theater perspective? No, uh, the approach is basically the thing. The thing we are. Uh, 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 we want to become a network of theater groups, theater groups that do belong to social movements within communities. So we don't want just to make critical uh, teaching or something like this. We want to create groups that will belong to the activist movements of the place in which we, we work with. So that's what we want. And what we see is that within activist movements, there is a, a tendency that when they have theater, to create a theater that is very uh, positive. The, the open chest, uh, the eye looking at the horizon where the sun of socialism is already rising and the face is already pink because of this sun that is rising and the eye is gazing, this magnificent sun that is coming up. So we, we are not like this. Uh, we don't think that it's a good thing to do plays like this. We think that it's better to do plays that are more negative, let's say like this, that are more critical. Uh, what do I mean by that? Is that uh, from time to time, this figure of the hero is a figure that is a very repressive one. Repressive in the sense that uh, if you are not this character here, you don't deserve, you don't belong. Also, it's a figure that stress more the ability to always rise, the ability to always have resilience, than stress the background in which the horror is happening, the social background, the political background in which the horror is happening. So it stress more the individual capacity of always being in action, rather than what's happening uh, at, uh, in the society at that moment. I'm going to tell you, a concrete example that I like to tell. Uh, it happened, uh, it happened uh, by the time that uh, uh, Marielle was executed. At, the, at that moment, I was in Salvador, uh, a city from the northeast of Brazil, and I was uh, with two different social movements. I was with La Dignidad, this movement of uh, Argentina, mm -hmm. and with the uh, uh, Movement Center de Bahia, the ruthless movement of Bahia, Mm -hmm. Because I like those movements very much and I was able to uh, have uh, some money in order to, to fund an exchange between them, a theatrical exchange between them. And the idea was the following. The idea was that on that first day, the day that we started the work, is that each of them would show to each other the, kind of the play that uh, they had. And then the, the, the play would be criticized and then they would create another play. 
the play from Bahia, the play from the Ruthless Movement, was a very beautiful play, a very beautiful scene, but a very complicated one. The scene started with three kids, three teenagers, black, uh, talking, in, uh, very likely, in a, in a slum. Uh, they say, oh, who's going to the party? Are you going to the party? No, I'm not going to the party. And talking about the party. Comes a neighbor, the neighbor shouts, police, police. The three of them start running. And one of them feels flat on the floor, on, on the ground. Comes the mother, takes the body of this black kid in her arms, cries, but stop crying after one second, rise with her fist, and start immediately saying a poetry that, uh, that would say, the, uh, in Portuguese, I am. Uh, I am a mother, but I'm not going to cry, I'm going to struggle. So, mãe, mas eu não vou chorar, vou lutar. And the poetry would go on and on. It was a beautiful scene, indeed. But a problematic scene also for me. Uh, why? And I've told them so. Is that in Brazil, uh, officially, 60,000 people are killed every year. Non officially, it's much higher because officially, 70,000 people disappear every year. If you, and then do never come back, 200, 300 do come back. So if you add up, it's 130,000 people that every year are killed very likely, you know? 60,000, according to the UN, is already a civil war of low intensity. Imagine what would be 130,000 a year. And I was saying, you look, there is 130,000 people that are killed. Most of them are youth, most of them are black. And it's not 130,000 fathers, it's not 130,000 mothers that do rise every single year in order to join the struggle. So you are talking about the exception, and the exception do exist. But tell me why, tell us why, the majority doesn't join it. Explain us about the rule, and not only about the exception. Don't, don't stress only the heroism, the capacity of the resilience, the capacity of struggle, but show how it is for the majority. Show why people can join. And then they create a new scene. And then it was Argentinians and Brazilians together. This scene started the same way. Are you going to add the party? I'm not going to the party. You should go to the party. No, I can't. Police, police. The three of them start running. One of them feels flat on the ground. The mother comes. She cries. She cries a lot. Comes someone that makes a gesture of struggle. She doesn't want to join. This person leaves, comes someone else, an Argentinian woman, a white woman. She comes, she sees the dead body of the kid. She embraces the, this, the, this body of the black kid. She cries a lot. Then she stands up. She takes in her arm the black woman. The two of them cry together. And then after that, they stand side by side. And at that moment, you can see on the face of the actress, of the white woman, that she's feeling discomfort, that there is something that she needs to say, that she needs to spill. And then finally, she spills it out, turns to the black woman and say to the black woman, I'm sorry, I'm sorry to ask you that, but I need to know, are you coming to work to my house tomorrow? because I cannot skip my work yet another day and I need someone to take care of my kids. So I need to know, are you coming? And then the black woman turns, look at the white woman, looks and she's furious. Her face show, is the expression of someone that's furious. She looks at the white woman and say, yes, tomorrow I'm coming. And that actually is for me a much more beautiful scene than the previous. Why? Because it shows the difficulty. It shows that political work is not something that can be done in a sparkle. It's not that political work is something that is very difficult to do. It's a, it's a, it was a scene that created more space for people to relate with because they could understand this. This heroism, we, we can be uh, surprised, amazed, and from time to time we need a heroic place too. But we need also a place in order to understand why people cannot yeah. do yeah. this work. We need it to be more uh, tender to each other. 
Yeah, well, I think what, what you're talking about is that um, in our work, we should be um, highlighting the, the contradictions, um, the, the difficulties um, to, do, to do the work and that we're operating within a system um, and um, in a system that it's really complex um, that we all you know, are part of. You have written and spoken ab about theater of the oppressed and you know, your work and of course the work of, of your, your father's lifetime um, has been a around theater of the oppressed and you have spoken of the evolution of theater of the oppressed over the last 40 years. Um, and, 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 and sort of uh, critiqued and highlighted similar challenges in theater of the oppressed recently um, and uh, in the ways in which um, uh, as the techniques have become really popular around the world, the politics of the work um, have been diluted um, to some extent in sort of this neoliberal times. Um, and you, of course, have talked about it not as a way of saying, let's not do the work, but as a call to action uh, to, to really sort of, as you're saying, sort of pay attention to the, the, the politics of the work if you're going to, in fact, do political theater, if, you, if you're, in fact, going to call it theater of the oppressed. Could you talk a little bit more about what you mean by all that and, and, and how, you, how you see it, um, perhaps into the future? I know that it's really difficult to think about the future now, but um, yes. Yeah, yeah no. Um... No, so uh, basically, uh, I, look, uh, I think that political theater in general is only as good as it can respond to the con a conjuncture, political conjuncture, a political moment. And that we know, the activists will know that. We will say, no, look, uh, to create a Bolshevik party maybe was a very good idea in 1905 if you were living in Russia, but right now Bolshevik party are not the best kind of organization that Right? Or, uh, I don't know, any kind of organization from time to time, you know, you need to, uh, to change the kind of organization. And that is something that is quite widely discussed. The problem uh, is that within theater, we don't have uh, that much this reflection. And we value the technique and the form maybe more than the relationship to the, 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 the content. So it's important in order to do a Brechtian play to have uh, someone passing with uh, uh, notes or to have a direct talking with uh, the other and stuff like this. But, but are we living in 1920s or 1950s in Germany? And the fact that we are not living by those times, uh, how does it affect the use of technique? Wh what I say basically is that we cannot reduce political theater to a certain set of techniques because the, the, the politics do not lie in the technique. The politics do lie in a lot of connection that you're doing with the topic, with the way that you uh, deal with, the, the, with this topic on scene, you know, the kind of technique that you use, with the kind of relationship that we establish in the ensemble in order to work and to create a display. Uh, it's linked with the kind of relation that you will be able to have or not with social movement, uh, it's it's a, a lot of questions that cannot be reduced into ah since I had two three four five people making intervention therefore there was emancipation and therefore there was politics. I've seen thousands and thousands of times you know reduction of certain problems to the most simple aspect of it, and that leads to uh, bad politics at the end of the day. To be more precise, I've seen more than 100 times, well, more than 100 times, maybe I'm exaggerating, but I've seen dozens and dozens of times performance on domestic violence in which it was a woman confronted to a man and uh, the man would beat up the wife and then we would be asked to join, replace the wife and to try to change the situation. But the set of the question was framed in such a manner that it could be only individualistic answers to this uh, question. So therefore it would be, ah, if you beat me up, then I'm going to leave the house. Where to? You know, 
I guess it's true for New York and it's the same as it's true for Rio de Janeiro. There isn't enough shelters for women that are beaten up by their partners. There right. isn't. They don't exist. Some of the shelters do not accept the kids. So are you going to leave the kids? So with, with money, are you going to survive outside if you decide to leave the home? So a lot of questions are not addressed and it's put completely under the carpet to stress just the capacity of deciding. I can, you know, mm-hmm. which are called uh, I, the Nike ideology, just do it. You know? Right. So right. Uh, yeah. in front of an abusive husband, just do it, leave the house. In front of the policeman, if you're a black person, just do it, confront him by stating your rights and stuff like this. Yesterday, I believe, someone got killed in the US, a black person got killed in the US, or was it two days ago, I'm sorry. I think it was- I've uh, seen it two days. Yeah, that the news came out, yes. Another uh, person by police. Yeah, Yeah, I saw it today, maybe. And there was no option of, you know, confronting the police and telling him, no, don't do that, don't do that. Uh, I forgot the name and I'm very sorry, but uh, there was this man named Phil Castle, as far as I remember, Phil Castle. A, a guy from the US, a man from the US, a black man that was detained while he was driving. He had a gun. Oh. He said perfectly well. What was his name? Sorry. Uh, Castile, Philando Castile. Philando Castile. He said everything that he had to say. He, he did all the drill perfectly well, and even though he got shot and killed. So it's not a, just a question on how do I personally, only by myself, uh, do things for my oppressor not to kill me. It's how we undo oppression, which is a different thing. It's not how personally can I dive through the nets of oppression, but it's how can I engage in a, in a, in a way, in a, in a process in order to dismantle oppression, which are two different things. Right. Uh, instead of uh, creating scenes um, or forum theater work that ends up blaming the victim um, and decontextualizing and absolving the community and, and the system of oppression that cont- contributes to that oppression. Um, I have one more question and then I'm going to uh, invite um, Aaron to come in to, so that we can answer some of the questions. Um, but I wonder if you can, in, in the same light, talk about the role of the Joker, the theater of the oppressed facilitator. Um, what, is, what is your approach to, to, to jokering? Where do you place the emphasis? Um, no, in- so look, um, my, my, and my role as a Joker, or what I try to emphasize as a Joker, is to ask to the audience if the audience is a collective and what are the lines within this collective of confrontation. By that I don't mean that they should uh, engage the next day uh, in a movement, uh, in, a, in, a, in a collective. Yeah. By that I mean that I always try to reflect on the contradiction that they are expressing uh, as a group. So my question to them is, uh, what are the things that you agree with it? And what are the things that you don't agree with? And to try to explore most of the time, and that's the most juicy uh, point, the things in which they don't agree. To not have a confirmation of what is going on on stage. There is uh, certain jokers and certain ways of creating for theater that sounds a little bit like those games in which uh, you need to have the right answer, right? And, Mm-hmm. Oh, you just need to leave the house. Bam. And that's the good thing. I heard that, you know, uh, in a certain country, they give the crown of the best uh, uh, spectator, the, of the <laughs> best intervention. Wow. And obviously, uh, I don't do this kind of thing. What I try is to engage in a dialogue, in a debate with uh, the public, in which the, I will be only the mirror of the contradiction that exists within the public already. I don't know if I'm, I'm clear. Uh, Mm -hmm. But I try to deepen the contradiction that exists within. When I I say contradiction, look, you said contradiction, no? So what I try to do is that uh, 
Okay, let's make a play about COVID. <laughs> I'm taking uh, this uh, uh, from my mind. Okay, so we can make a play about COVID in which I'm going to talk with Bolsonaro, with Trump and something like this, but then do I have really the option to talk directly with him? Mm -hmm. I don't. Uh, I personally don't. I don't have their phone numbers and actually I don't even want to. Uh, because even if I'm able to change their policy, which I don't think, it would be only whispering at the ears of the powerful where the question is precisely how to create power from below and not to be uh, in the prince, in the king's ear and whisper the good uh, policies to be made. So I'm going to be talking and trying to make an organization with people around me, okay. which is going to be a difficult thing, but let's suppose that I have a character that will come with the following contradiction. A character comes that I try to convince and we should do something against those policies that Bolsonaro wants to implement. It's horrible, it's genocide. And the guy answers back to me and says, no, this is a blessing for me. This is a blessing for me. The best thing that occurred to, to my life is COVID. I was unemployed, it's been five months. Right now with COVID, I got an employment as a delivery boy, delivery man. I've, you know, actually, this has happened with my mother. Uh, she was at her place. Uh, someone came to, to, to deliver food. And my mother said, ah, how horrible, how terrible that you are hard to... And the guy answered, no, no, no. I'm very happy with COVID. Because it was much worse to, to, to be a, an, an unemployed person uh, in Brazil. Be, and COVID gave me an option. How am I going to talk to this person in order to make this person join a struggle against Bolsonaro? So that, and that is, is the question that I'm going to throw to the audience. And, there is, and that's a real question. It's a very sincere question. I don't have the answer. It's not something that is in my, uh, I don't know how you say that. You're under, uh, under your sleeve, right? Um, it's not under my sleeve. I don't have the the magic answer, but what you're articulating here again is the ways in which the system operates, you know, which make it so hard both to represent it theatrically and also yeah. to, to fight, uh, to change it. Um, and part of it, and part of that critique that I've heard from you is a critique of theater itself, right? In order, in order for us to be able to change the system as well, we also need to change theater and the way we do theater um, as well. Um, uh, so, so thank you for I all guess, the reflections. Yeah. No, just one sentence on what you said, you know, the means of production of this world are the means of production that produce this world. If we want to change this world, we need to change the means of production that do produce this world. And theater is one of them. Yeah. So it's not enough to take over theater and to have black, queer, Latins being on theater as usual, we also need to transform theater. Right. Working class on theater. It's not enough. We need to transform theater if you want to have a chance in transforming the world. Right. Right. And not only theater. Huh? Yeah, absolutely. Not, not only access to theater, but also the means of production, which by that you mean people having the, the tools to, to create and use theater to fight for their emancipation, their liberation. Um, yeah. uh, so uh, I, I'm going to bring in Aaron because I, uh, and I'm going to invite folks to use the Q&A feature to submit questions. Um, Aaron's going to help us, you know, Look at the questions and the themes that are coming up. Um, yes. Yeah, thank you so much for that. That was really, really wonderful. Um, I would say, I guess, I'm just looking from the top down. There first is just um, a comment about George Floyd being the name of the man who was killed in Minneapolis by the police on Monday. Thank you, thank and then you. the, um, I think the tape, were, the tape came out on the internet yesterday, which is yesterday, yes. how the week has unfolded. Um, let me think. I think the first question I would say, maybe going off of what some of what you were just talking about um, is, let's see, you're, if I understand your point correctly, you're saying that so many, 
political theater organizations makers are more interested in the form and structure of theater rather than the goal of the play or the situation it is addressing. Do you think there are simple structures or building blocks upon which a group can devise or craft a piece that effectively addresses socio-political issues? What are your foundational building blocks for crafting a piece, if, if you have an example? That's a very long question, right? It is. No, yeah. <laughs> And for the next question, can I ask you to speak slower, please? Of course, uh, because, sorry, uh, <laughs> sorry about that. Yeah. Uh, no, uh, so if I understood correctly the question. Yeah. No, it's this, is that I don't, at the end of the day, uh, really what I think is that a fiat of the press group shouldn't exist because to identify as fiat of the press and especially if you identify as field of the press as a set of technique, then always, you know, you, it can be a play about homophobia in a family, about the uh, school to prison pipeline in the US. It can be about uh, the ecological uh, disaster that we are working towards. And we only will have a specific set of tools. And why do we think that this set of tools, it's better than any other? So, but I, I consider this uh, to be true for all the kind of political forms of theater. It's true for epic theater. It's true for Comedia dell'arte. It's true for any kind of theater. Dialectical, dialectical theater is not a really a form. But if we read documentary theater, if we reduce the content always thinking first about the technique that we have to deal with it. Therefore, we are skipping the point, I think. We are not addressing the point. Look, there is a, a little story by Brecht that I think is very easy to, to, to illustrate this point. Uh, so it's a story of this uh, alter ego from Brecht that was called uh, Mr. Kerner. Mr. Kerner goes to a, a garden and see a garden in front of his that is uh, using his scissor in order to create a perfect sphere out of a basil tree. If my English is not correct, please do correct me, okay? A perfect sphere out of a basil tree. And he makes this sphere and it's perfect and it's amazing. Mr. Kuhner gets a little very impressed by it and asks the scissor in order to, with another basil tree, to try to do the same, the gardeners. Is okay with it. The gardener gives the scissor, goes away. Mr. Gunner starts scissoring, scissoring, and he makes a, a mistake in a certain place. And there's a fail. So he cuts and cuts more the tree. And he makes a hole in another place. So in order to make the perfect sphere, he's going to cut and cut and cut more. And now there's another fail. And then he's going to cut, cut, cut more. At the end of the day, he's able to make a very... Uh, a little sphere, perfect sphere, but very little. Comes the gardener, looks at the basil tree, looks at this very tiny sphere and he says, look, I can see the sphere. I can no longer see the basil tree. <laughs> and from time to time, I think that we have this in mind. We want perfect spheres. But from time to time, we no longer see the basal tree at the end of the day. So I don't have a particular critique to documentary theater, to epic theater, to theater of the press. I have the same one for all of them. <laughs> Are we using the, the appropriate set of technique? If you ask, if I ask you, is a hammer a good tool? You would answer me, yes, if you have nails. <laughs> Thank you. Um, let's see, a question about, let's, see. there are a couple of comments and questions and there's gratitude about the, this, the, the piece you were talking about with the white Argentine woman and the black woman. Um, and there was a question about, or there was a comment about how resonant it feels in the United States, given the context of what's happening here. Um, and a question about, is there a way, would there be a way to, to bring it to life here? And then a question about, um, an appreciation of the, the strength of the statement and what would you do after that piece to sustain the strong message or after those moments in the piece to sustain that strong message? Well, then, uh, you know, then it's up to the movements themselves to decide. There is a moment in which theater is no longer the only answer. 
not only fiat of the press is a determinate set of tools, but fiat is also a determinate set of tools, fiat uh, as good as it can be. My father wanted the audience, you know, uh, spectators to become spect actors. And then Sanjoy Ganguly, who is the founder of Gen Sanskrit, say yes, and the actors should become activists too. Yeah, so take, I uh, actors should become spectators, and actors should become activists. So to join a longer thing, because theater can only be a very tiny step, a wonderful maybe, but tiny step in a long march for emancipation. Yeah, I was going to say, Julian, that as you were saying that, it reminded me that I think it was Sanjoy uh, who said that our work starts when our theater is done or when our theater ends, when it comes to our political. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yes, yes. So that's why, you know, I'm getting you know, older. I'm 45. I'm not going to start a movement, a social movement, but that's why there was such a strong focus in the popular theater, popular theater school, to create with the social movements, to create inside the social movements. But then we saw that because of certain uh, difficulties of the social movement, because people already have so many tasks, it was, <laughs> we had ourselves to not become a social movement, but to create these networks of theater groups that we are going, that we were uh, helping to blossom, to, to exist, theater group that would be disseminated among different social movements. So they continue the struggle after. When this scene is created, this scene was created with the, the housing movement of Salvador, of Bahia, then it was up to them, the housing movement, to perform in other places, to create a campaign against the, the police brutality against the, the black genocide that is happening right in Brazil and that right now have another uh, way of existing, which is the, the COVID, which kills mostly poor and black people here in, in Brazil. Uh, so it's up to them uh, to, to continue the work. Thank you. Um, can you share how the CTO is doing in times of COVID? Is it possible to do online work, maybe with smartphones? What about the financial situation? What can one do to help this work? Yeah, I, I uh, uh, so, uh, so ETP is a part of CTO, uh, but CTO is a much bigger structure than ETP. And uh, it would be better to talk with Joe Brito uh, about CTO because I'm formerly not a member of CTO. Uh, they are doing a campaign online to receive the funds that they uh, were able to reach the, the first goal. And I don't know now uh, for the next one. Uh, for the, regarding the online trainings, well, yes, that's what we are doing. We are meeting at least once in a week. Uh, at uh, the end of last year, we were a little bit less than, uh, than 50. And now in our meetings, we are around 25. A little bit more from time to time, a little bit less from time to time, but the, the number would be 25. And we are creating online uh, gatherings in which uh, we use movies as a way to critique the ideology of the, those movies. So, uh, for instance, we use the Braveheart. I don't know if you know the movie Braveheart with Mel Gibson. And we use the moment of the, the talk of the leader. I don't know if you remember the movie. I, it's not one of my favorite, let's say like this. And so there is a mo moment before the battle, uh, the Scots look at the Brits and they are, you know, it's one against 10 and uh, the others are much better armies, uh, you know, our weapons and stuff like this. And the Scots say, look, we should get going, not looking good. They look to the ground, they look depressed. And then comes Mel Gibson. And Mel Gibson makes this amazing speech, this fantastic speech. And then people that were looking at the ground slowly, slowly, they start looking up. They start looking at each other. And at the end of the speech, all of them yell together, yeah, yeah. And they go and fight and they win over the Brits. 
this the ideology that it lies within a picture a movie like this is that the mass is a band of ships that do need a leader do need someone to make a perfect speech in order to have a certain consistency otherwise they would be uh, the, you know, cowards that would dismantle they need an external factor to make them come together and to fight and then we show this a uh, little bit of movie we show a little bit of a movie called pride i don't know if you heard about this movie. Mm. it's not a very yeah you heard about it yeah, yeah. it's a, a a friend of mine called it a socialist feel good movie <laughs> it's a movie uh, in the 80s in which uh, a group of gay and lesbian uh, decide to support the miners that are on strike against the mother of neoliberalism against touch and there is again the speech of the leader the leader speak in front of you know of the people he makes a beautiful speech uh, why the police are so light on us right now uh, did they finally get tired of all that Gloria Gaynor uh, it's, it's a very funny speech uh, why are they so soft on us I don't know. and then he comes and then he say no it's because they are fighting against the miners and we need to support the miners because they have the common enemy with us we also are fighting as the police we are fighting against stature but they are fighting and they are hungry right now because it's been more that they are uh, on strike and we need to support and we need to take money a beautiful speech an amazing speech a guy raises his hands and the first comment that he makes is, I know those guys. I know those guys because I was born in coal land. And every morning they would beat me because of who I am before going to school. And after school they would beat me too. I will never going to help them. And then he leaves the room and most of the people leave the room at this moment. This second scene is a much richer scene because it, again, it shows political work, not as just a magnificent speech, just a wonderful guy that appears and shows off and everybody gathers and fights, but shows political work as work, as a hard work. And if you notice, the guy that answered back, I'm not going to help them because they beat me all the time. It's impossible to say if it's right or wrong. It's a contradictory character. Again, he's right and wrong at the same time. Like this, uh, 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 this is a good delivery man, the man making the delivery, he's right and wrong at the same time. Like the, the white woman that asks for help because she cannot cope with her kids and have to work at the same time. And this black woman that accepts at the same time. So I always prefer to work with characters that are right and wrong at the same time, rather than have this kind of political theater in which as soon as a character enters the stage, Ah, we know if he's on the good side or in the bad side. This this also reminds me, Julian, to a certain extent, what you're what you're saying about interventions, and perhaps one of the reasons why theater of the oppressed has become so popular all around the world and in this times now is that there's such an uh, obsession with the right answer or success or quantifying. Mm -hmm you know, a response um, and, and, and demonstrating success. And of course, in this country, individualism. So there's this notion that if I arrive at the right intervention, if I arrive at the right potential solution, then I, I've done the work. Um, when in fact, <laughs> theater of the oppressed is interested in primarily is in the, in the, dia in the dialogue, in the dialectical in those contradictions and, and, and the multiplicity of potential interventions. Um, yeah, there was a, a Brazilian play writer, Chico de Assis, that uh, passed away, I don't know, five years ago now, maybe. But he had a very funny sentence that he says, a flies enter the stage, the public wants to know, is it a good fly or a bad fly? And I think that is very true, <laughs> that, you know, most of us, we have this tendency of trying to fit the character within good or bad. And also it's very true what we're saying about the intervention is that we, for many uh, different reasons, but people have the expectation from time to time that forum theater will be the magic solution that will be able to solve 
problems that are 100 years old, that are deeply entrenched in our society, that are structural in our society, that form fear, the fear of the press, will be able to solve the problem within, uh, you know, within few interventions on stage. And then, you know, after five, six interventions, you know, we'll be able to dismantle racism, but we'll be able to dismantle patriarchy, capitalism, name it. And I think that, you know, I don't know, you know, from time to time, I believe, yes, that we need to, to feel brave. We need to, you know, to see on stage heroism and to, to look at each other and to have a little bit of this Mel Gibson speech from the stage and go up. But I believe also that we cannot be reduced to that. That fiat of the oppressed cannot be, or forum theater cannot be the place of, uh, what do you call that in, in English, of, um, an of offshore heroism, you know? <laughs> uh, that you, you, it's not going to be the protagonist of the play that's going to be alright. It is going to be open for a place, for a place, for, for people to be alright, you know? Um, Tercerizado in Portuguese, I don't have the word right now. But anyway, yes, because I, I fear that this optimism, this enthusiasm that we can feel on stage is an optimism that's going to die in the next corner. Yeah. That's going to die a, a few minutes after the performance. And then it's going to produce exactly what my father didn't want Fiat of the Press to do, catharsis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do we have time for a couple more questions? Um... I think for we have time for one more question. Does that sound good to you too? Yeah. Um, it's kind of, this is a one articulation of it, but it is a question that is repeated many times. And also just to say, um, amongst these questions are many comments of gratitude and uh, thanks to you both for, for being here. Memories, uh, memories of workshops in the past. Um, so Take a picture I, of all of them and send it to me. I will, uh, we'll, we can copy and paste them so you can take a look at all of them. Um, the, uh, happy to. This is a variation, uh, a variation on a theme, but it's a, a number of questions about the means for, ooh, now it's jumped, um, the means for changing production. What does that look like? What are there, are there tools, um, are there tools or examples of how you think about changing the means of production of theater making? Uh, I, I, I don't, it, 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 I cannot answer in a general manner because it's a very specific, uh, it's, it, 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 the answer can only be specific to certain places. But look, I'm going to, to talk about the first experience of Fiat of the Press because it's, a, it's one that's often for, uh, forgotten and I think that it's, it's rather amazing. Uh, so it's, it was newspaper theater, this way of doing theater with news from the newspaper. So why was it done and what way it was created? The first reason is because the text of the, the news was already passed by the censor by the censorship. So during Brazilian uh, dictatorship, there was censorship and you could have access to news from newspapers and they were already approved text. And then the whole trick was to, with the techniques, be able to be in contradiction with those news and to be able to try to extract the truth that those news were hiding by using those techniques. So to be not in favor, not repeating the text, but to be in contradiction with the text, in a critique of the text that was given. And there was, I don't know, I forgot now how many, but 17 techniques, I believe, that were created. Uh, so, uh, but that was one of the goals. So first goal, to pass by the censor, then to be able to create techniques that would, could create the truth by, or a truth at least, in order to uh, try to extract the truth from those texts. And then third thing, uh, it was that those techniques should be reproducible enough in order to be easily uh, taken by other groups and created by other groups. Uh, so that was done. Uh, it was performed in a professional theater, but it was very clearly made in such a way that they were targeting people from union to come in because they would give it for free to unions. They would say, look, we can help you out to create the second edition. The first edition, we do it. The second edition is up to you to do it. And then research were made, and it seems that only in the city of Sao Paulo, which is the largest city of Brazil, 
at the peak of the repression, of the Brazilian repression in 71, 72, 73, they were up to 70, a seven and a zero. I always mix up with one and 17 and 70, so seven and a zero. Groups of newspaper theater that were created, that were completely undercover network of, uh, of theater against the dictatorship and criticizing the dictatorship. So this is a way in which uh, the means of production of theater were changed, both by the ways of the techniques that were used, but also by the ways in which theater became no longer just an object for consumption, but a tool for organization, a tool of organization of a full network. And I believe that this cannot be reproduced all the time, but there is seminal ideas over there of creating a set of techniques that were in correspondence to a certain time, fighting against the, the censorship, but also that had an organization, organizational capacity within. So that's what would be three very general ideas that I believe that are inside the newspaper feed. I'm not saying to repeat newspaper theater, but creating a set of techniques that is adapted to your time, adapt in the sense that it contradicts the times, and that at the same time it can help not only to the creation of place, but to create uh, an organization, to help organizing people with it. So the, those three things came together. And as you can see, this does not come at the expense of cutting the aesthetical aspect of it, of it. It's only when the aesthetics are good that the politics can be good too. The good political line creates also a good aesthetics of the play. Yeah. As I see it. Thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah, thank, thank you, Aaron. I, I, I would be um, uh, remiss if I didn't say that um, one of the popular movements um, Julian, that you have worked closely with uh, the Jana Sanskriti movement in India, perhaps the largest theater of the oppressed movement in the world, um, recently was affected by a super cyclone that affected the West Bengal region of India. Um, and some of their structures and many of the villages where they do their work in were affected and people need food and medicine and they need to rebuild. Um, and I know there's uh, colleagues uh, from around the world have been um, raising funds to, to help them continue their, their, their work. Um, uh, there's an effort going on here in the States to raise some funds. We're gonna post a link on the, on the chat if our text for that. at the time. Um, so if you, you want to contribute to their work that you, and you know their work, that you, uh, I know they've been seminal in your own uh, development as a, as a theater maker and as an activist and as a theater of the oppressed practitioner. So I just wanted to honor that as well. Yeah, Genesis Sanskriti is more or less uh, 300,000 people doing theater of the press in a specific area of India uh, and using again theater, not only as a, as a performance, but as a way of organizing people. And it's a place in which the parallel lines do meet both a fantastic or political conceptions, both, both fantastic things, and also fantastic people that are in it. So uh, it's, uh, as someone said today, I said that, I saw that in a post, it's the spiritual house of Tio, I guess. Thank you. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, I just want to update our audiences on a couple of upcoming events, if that is okay, before we, we duck out. Uh, this Friday, May 29th at 3.30, we, there is a panel called Queering Borders, Immigration and the Arts, uh, and the workshop is partnering with uh, Immigration Equality and the National Queer Theater, so we're very much looking forward to that. Uh, Victor Cazares, our Tau Playwright in Residence, will be a part of that conversation. On Monday, we have a on Monday at Three Master Class with director Will Davis, uh, who is teaching a class called Objects and the Songs They Sing about composition, uh, stage composition and picture with objects. And next Wednesday, we have a fireside chat with uh, one of our 2050 directing fellows, Camille Howard, who will be in conversation with director, writer, creator, performer, uh, 
New York Theater Workshop, Usual Suspect, Ruben Santiago Hudson. So we hope that you will tune into all of those. There is a full calendar of events online. Um, and again, as we said, all of these events are free and open to the public. If you are, are feeling generous, we would appreciate any gift that you could make, $5, $10, $25. Um, and there is a short survey that will be linked out in the chat or in the comments on Facebook. Uh, we'd love to hear from you about uh, how we're doing and what we could be doing better. Um, again, Alex and Julian, thank you so much. Until next time, please be well, take care of yourselves. And we look forward to being in a uh, space with you again soon. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thanks a lot for Stay safe. Sending lots of love to you and everybody in Brazil. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for this space. Huh? Ciao. Hope to see you soon, Alex. Hope to Bye. see you soon. Bye.